All right, everyone. Well, um, welcome and thanks for coming to the last of the four parts on the disaster sheltering. Um, with this section, we're going to focus on the large animal shelter, um, looking at the standard operating procedures for that. If you were at the last session last week, um, we focused on the details of the small animal shelter, and so this will go along with those, those except um, what will be happening at your large animal facility. As with the other presentations, they have all been sponsored through a grant for the um, National Association of County and City Health Officials um, to Colorado Pet Aid and the Colorado Veterinary Medical Reserve Corps. So those are the folks who sponsored um, the creation of these and the presentation of these um, by myself, Diane Robinson. And this is my website or my contact information if you have any questions to email me. Um, as far as questions throughout the presentation, if you have any, please feel free to type them in the chat and I will um, answer those questions as I can um, on it. So please feel free to ask any of those questions that you may have. So the goals of this, what we want to look at are um, the roles within it. So the roles that we talked about in the small animal shelter, all of those positions will also be in the large animal shelter. So we'll look at those and then what I want to look at are um, suggested standard, standard operating procedures or SOPs um, for operating the shelter and the equipment and supplies that you'll need to do that. Um, shelter setup, we'll talk about that, although with this a lot of times what you have is a more established structure for it because we're in fairgrounds or in similar facilities um, that are made to accommodate the large animal. We'll talk about intake and documentation and with that looking at some of the challenges of doing it on the large animals, um, animal care, um, cleaning and sanitation of, um, of the uh, facility, equipment, those kind of things and then finally daily routines. Unlike the um, the small animal shelter with your cats and dogs, what you have is kind of a different population of people in this. Um, with your large animals, the owners a lot of times are, particularly with your horse owners, but some with your other animals that will come in, those owners are accustomed to being at horse shows or at events, and so they're traveling, they've got campers in um, in their horse trailers, or they've got other campers that they're used to sleeping in, staying at the fairgrounds. Um, with these owners, a lot of times having a plan for where these folks can be parking their trailers and can be living on site is going to be important if you can provide that. A lot of these folks are going to want to be involved in the care of the animal in some capacity. It's going to vary what the animals are. It's going to vary what your space and availability at the facility is. Uh, but if you can plan to have them, it's not so much a co-located shelter as we've talked about in the past. Your co-location, remember, is where you have your owners in the immediate proximity of the animals. What you have with this facility, though, are folks who are going to want to stay. Another consideration is a lot of these people are going to have other animals, so smaller companion animals with them. And so can you accommodate a one location where they can have their large animals housed, they can be living on site in their trailers or their campers, um, and where there is a setup where they are able to keep their small animals with them as well. You may not be able to accommodate all of those things, um, but be prepared. Those are going to be things that a lot of these folks are going to be wanting. Additionally, with the large animal, is you won't always have a situation where they have just one type of animal. They might have multiple species. And so looking at how you're going to accommodate those family units as far as the multiple species that are going to be there. So with it, looking at the shelters, primarily if you're using uh, fairgrounds or ag facilities. So you have stalls that are already set up. Um, you have facilities that are accustomed to the operation of a large animal. With it, the challenges, of course, are, you know, a lot of these facilities during disaster season, which is primarily spring, summer, fall, are going to be our disaster seasons. Um, what you have with these facilities are also summer and fall are 
primary times for events to be going on. So in, you know, when we had talked about sheltering in the very beginning and establishing um, memorandums of understanding or your agreement with the facility operators, looking at the ability to be able to access these facilities, what time of year, this is going to be critical because they do overlap. And if it is fair or there is, you know, a horse show going on at the event, is there another location within that, a different building that you might be able to access or some place that you can set up? Knowing that in advance is critical uh, when the disaster hits because you don't want to be scrambling with these animals at the last minute. You've already got an event going and now you're trying to find placement for them. So see what you can set up ahead of time. Um, with, the, with these facilities you have um, stalls often that are already set up. There may be temporary panel panels, temporary pens that you can set up for these guys as well. Um, and hopefully there's extra buildings and extra space with it that you're running you you're gonna have different species but certainly if you can have um, separation for some of the species uh, you may have family units that will come in and I'll talk about that in a bit but you may need different buildings for some of your um, different species that are coming in um, particularly it's going to be a high stress environment anyway and so for horses for example that aren't used to llamas or alpacas or a donkey when a donkey bays that freaks out horses um, so if you have separation buildings that way for some of those animals being able to house the animals individually particularly right now talking about horses horses are um, resource guards and they're highly food aggressive um, and so within the herds that they're established they're going to re-establish their herd with any animals that come into that so if you have groups of horses that you're housing together that hierarchy is going to be worked out and re-established and particularly at meal time when they can get really aggressive with one another it's dangerous for the horses within a group pen so being able to house them individually is going to be best for the herd and safest for the fair caretakers because they're not having to go into a pen or working around large groups of horses where you might have, you know, not being able to control which rear end is pointed in which direction. Um, it's easy for them to get trampled um, as horses are, are vying for position. Additionally with that is looking at where you're housing your stallions. Any intact male, whether it's horses or other animals, um, separating those intact males from the females and where you're housing the stallions in that can it be in a separate location that you can better control that environment. We don't want just anybody having access to those guys uh, and so if it can be in a separate building or if they can be confined to one area of the building. Now I hear people a lot of times where you have to separate stallions and they can't be next to each other and they can't see one another. Um, with these guys we certainly don't want them in together but reality is in any stud farm you're going to have stallions that are going to be stalled next to each other. They're going to be across from each other. Certainly looking at how your Placing your animals if you have stallions that are really getting after each other that you're putting space between them or if you can leave stalls between horses. Um, but reality is a space is going to be a problem and you're not going to necessarily be able to do that. But if we can keep the mares as far away from the stallions as possible, it will cut down on some of those behaviors with it. For mares that come in with um, foals that are still nursing or have not yet been weaned, finding placement for them, if a lot of times these guys are in outdoor runs or they've got larger um, mare stalls so that there's room for the foals to be safely housed in there, your general average size stall can be really small space um, and particularly for mares who or it's later in the in the process the foals are older the mares start to get impatient with the foals with the nursing 
potential for injury to those foals goes up in the smaller pens. So looking at where you're placing those animals in the facility, um, in the stall, and certainly we it, during a, a natural disaster, we don't want to be weaning foals, um, but we do need to look at where we're placing them so it's the safest environment for both the mare and the foal. With um, with your animals, they're going to come in highly stressed anyway. Um, what you may have, you may have injured animals that are coming in. You may have sick animals. Um, depending on the socialization level of some of the animals, being around the different species and all of the activity, keeping an eye on those animals. And if you can find a calmer area of the facility, or you have a horse that's never seen. A donkey or a llama and they're in a panic state over it can you relocate those animals to a less stressful place quieter calmer area of the shelter we're constantly evaluating uh, the animals in any of our facilities so both small and large animal we want to be evaluating how the animals are adapting to the disaster shelter and how they're continuing to progress. They should be settling in and getting comfortable with the routine. If they continually maintain a high state of stress, then we need to rework where we have them or what we're doing with them so we can try and bring down that level of um, stress for them so that, you know, a, healthy animal is going to be an animal that's not, but I mean, if they're content, if they're not stressed, they're getting the proper rest, they're getting the proper feed, um, they're going to be less susceptible to injury and illness in these events. With these guys, um, looking at the animals that are coming in and the level of sickness, we want to make sure that there's an isolation area for any animals that look like they may be sick, um, and particularly animals that are showing signs of something that could be contagious. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some, some horse-specific stuff to look at um, as far as the precautions we're taking with them. With some of these horses or, or, well, animals, I talk a lot about horses, there's a mix of them, but with some of these animals that are coming in, they're show animals, they're vaccinated, they've got, you know, everything that they need to go into an, a, a multi-animal environment. This is not like what we have in in your stable or even a boarding stable. Generally, there's going to be some kind of an isolation time when an animal, new animal is introduced to the herd. So even if it's being just introduced to a stall within the barn, having a separate ISO area to make sure that the animal isn't going to break with anything, we don't have that option in the disaster shelter. So it's play, paying particular attention to any animals that may look like they're not feeling well, um, that's going to have any kind of drainage mucus coming from um, any of the orifices. We want to watch these guys. Um, and certainly in intake, we can, can ask the questions with the owned animals that are coming in as far as the health status of those animals. But reality is there's going to be a lot of unknowns, and you may have a really expensive show animal and a backyard animal that's never been off the property, never seen a veterinarian, um, which it may be just as healthy, but if it's not vaccinated coming into the environment, it certainly makes it more susceptible. So we want to watch as much with the precautions as we can with that. Um, with the different species, also all of this is con consulting with the veterinarian um, and veterinarians that are experts in this particular species. So you're going to have very different needs of your sheep, your goats, your your cattle, if they're show cattle or pets coming in, um, and your horses, llamas, alpacas, all of these animals will have different needs, they'll have different feeding requirements, and certainly different vaccination and care requirements. So any questions about that as far as where they're being housed, consult with the experts in that. And a lot of times those experts are also the owners who are bringing those animals in. So don't be afraid to rely on your owners to be able to um, assist you with questions about those particular species. If you have family units coming in, 
house them near each other whenever possible. If you're trying to set up separate species buildings, there may be um, different species within a family unit that you may or may not be able to accommodate. But with this, a lot of times is you'll have, you know, the guardian, the llama, who's the guardian of the herd of sheep. So look at how you're going to house those and also again consult with the owners of these animals in what additional stress is it going to add to the animal if you pull that llama away from the sheep what kind of added stress and what kind of added danger is it going to add because that animal is used to protecting its herd so look at how you're housing those guys um, a lot of times where we have where obviously cats are going to be in one area and dogs in another area and we're separating our small animal it may not be as clear cut in your barns as what you have um, in in the cat and dog shelter so for your intake and documentation um, with these guys same as in the small animal shelter we're going to ha want to have an area near the front with these guys, what you have though are trailers bringing them in, so it may not be an area where they're leading the animals up to the table to have them processed in. You're going to be going and processing the specific animal at the trailer. But what we still want to have is a place for owners to come in. You can get the initial documentation from them, so giving them a place to sit. You can start running down the information on what the animal is. Is, um, where the owners are going to be staying, contact information, whatever that looks like, have a place for you to be able to process them and then you can go to the trailer and uh, process the animal in. We need a large space for this um, and certainly at these facilities if you can have some kind of a perimeter fencing we can secure it so as animals are being offloaded we don't have any risk of those animals escaping. Are there any questions? Feel free to type a question if you have any questions. Um, for your field teams, field teams are going to be bringing these in um, and we see a lot of them coming in where the field teams are bringing horses or any of the large animal, a whole variety of large animals uh, and you have a substantial population of different species in Colorado. Um, some of them are are generalized locations you hopefully in your community know where those specialty animals are and where the large animals are um, paying attention to where boarding stables are where you know an alpaca breeder is or you know, those kind of folks so you have an idea of what might be coming in and also so you can help educate them on where they need to bring their animals um, let me touch on communication and here before we go too far one of the things is you will have your good Samaritans who are picking up animals and, and transporting them. They need to know where the shelter is. One of the big communication problems is you have field teams that are rescuing, that are the jurisdictional authority that are rescuing your large animals, but you also have people who happen to have a trailer and who are going and picking these animals up. Um, that's a scary proposition for an owner to put their animal on the trailer of somebody who says that they're there to help. If you can screen and have an established team ahead of time who's going to do your transport stuff. That's what I'm talking about here with your field teams. These are people who are part of the actual response. They know where the disaster shelter is and they've got the authority to be picking these animals up. A problem with Good Samaritans who are picking animals up, if they don't know where to take them, you a lot of times will have groups who kind of pop up who are housing animals. It may be a rescue or it may be just a farm they want to help. And so social media a lot of times is driving those. So you'll find, and I know this happened um, quite a bit last year in the fires that were in Colorado, um, there were groups that were kind of popping up animals were being taken to some of those locations that weren't the actual large animal shelter it's harder for owners to find their animals at that point 
So um, making sure that the rescue teams and the public know where the animals are going to go and who's going to be picking those animals up. With these, um, if the field teams are bringing animals in, whether it's owner requested or it's just animals that they've picked up, having a separate location where they can bring their vehicles in, um, trailer for these facilities, it's going to be critical anyway that you have space for trailering these animals for trailers to turn around. Um, so with this having um, but having a place where these folks can come in and the animals can be processed in from from their location. Owners are going to be anxious to get their animals if they've been owner requested or even if they're strays and they've been out looking for them. Um, so being able to properly process those animals so you don't have random people just coming and picking the animals up. The supplies for intake, um, gloves, and I know generally we don't use nitrile gloves when we're doing barn work. Keep in mind it's a disaster shelter. There's unknowns with these animals. Um, so the stuff you would normally do at your barn or at your boarding facility is not what we're going to do at a disaster shelter. We want to take those added precautions with the animals and we never want to send what was a healthy, well vaccinated, well cared for animal. We never want to have it develop anything, any animal, whether develop any diseases in the shelter. So taking those extra precautions is going to be critical. Hand sanitizer needs to be available everywhere um, at the intake area having water. Some of these owners may have driven from quite a distance so having water available for them. Um, having uh, water that you can fill up the buckets of the animals um, while you're processing them in in the trailers uh, but certainly while they're in their stalls we want to get water available for them right away. Um, we'll talk about the forms that you need to have for your intake and then clipboards are really important at the in the large animal facility uh, because you're going to the trailers and you're processing the animals a lot of times in at the trailers. Um, so all of your identification and I'll break down some of the identification supplies and then your camera so that you can photograph the animal, um, photograph the owner and the animal as well. Additional supplies for your intake area as part of our tracking process. Um, we want to make sure that you've got you know all the basics. You can never never have enough duct tape. Um, three ring binders is where we're going to hold all of the paperwork or where I recommend this is again this is a process that works for me. Um, page protectors for the intake paperwork to go into and then those page protectors go into the three ring binder. If you have computer available so you can be um, intaking in a database with the computer uh, but you also want to have a printer or copier available so that you can make a copy of all the intake paperwork um, that the owners are going to need and give them a copy of it. If you're planning on doing um, the the carbon um, the carbon that's a bit old school but if you're you're doing the multiple copies of the paperwork um, the duplicates the three or two levels um, you can do that it's a lot of times easier and cheaper to just have you know a plain form that you photocopy and then you give those copies to the owners. So um, so all of your paperwork, you need to have an animal intake owner release. You should have a daily care sheet for the stalls. Um, these, this is an example of a mare band. This mare band, um, it, you can see that it's got the the number on it here. I, if at all possible, not leaving a stall, uh, halter on a horse in a stall um, is ideal. Horses are really very talented um, at injuring themselves. So having a stall, particularly if it's not a breakaway, if it's this type of halter that you see here, um, they can get caught on something. A horse can't break these, but they can do a lot of damage to themselves if they get caught on something and trying to get out. If they're in a halter, having a halter with a breakaway and 
for those of you who may not be familiar with that, a breakaway is a leather strap here that connects the top part of the halter uh, and a horse can break that. So looking at the identification with them by putting on something like a mare band, they can't get caught up in that and it maintains that identification number. You don't have to get them with the number already written on it. You can just use a Sharpie and write the ID number on it. The other thing that you can do, um, there are different bandages that I've seen, some of them where it's more like a shoestring almost um, cord that's used. It's connected with a clip and the little metal clip is something that actually can break or the horse can pull out of it so if it gets caught in that and what you can do is you can attach um, like the ear tags for livestock uh, you can attach it to the the band we're not attaching ear tags to the actual animal we're attaching it to the the string or the band uh, and use the ID tag on that if you're keeping the halters on which I have seen done you keep the halters on and this they attach um, with zip tie they attach the ear band to the halter here where the ring is if you are doing that make sure that you're trimming the zip tie so that the horse can't get poked with that with these guys then you can also ID band the owners and those are with the ID bands that you would put on your cats and dollars dogs. They're the paper bands. You can write the animal ID information on it and then put that band around the owner's wrist. With it what you have then is you have identifying access to a barn or a building or a particular space within the facility where animals are being housed which helps you track owners who's where um, and do they have an authorization to be in that part of the facility. Um, security is really important so security at the gate, security at the barn doors, uh, and then just for your staff and volunteers to be keeping an eye on people who are in there. Do they have some kind of identifier that they should be in there? With your binder, I already mentioned the page protectors. Um, with that we put the paperwork in the page protector and then filing it according to animal identification number is actually what's worked best for me because then you can flip through and it's numeric um, trying to find an animal based on its name or the owner's name uh, I found is more challenging but the ID number you can just go through numerically and, and track them. Um, with if you have a lot of different species, having identifiers for those species and having them in separate location in a separate binder. Um, if you have a family unit that has multiple species, making sure that the paperwork connects those animals. So if you have two horses, a donkey, a llama, and three sheep, that the paperwork in some way identifies that there are multiples in that family unit so whether you're putting that on the paperwork or in it's how you're tying that information you want to make sure the family units are tied together you'll also want to have a stray animal binder and photos are really helpful there as you're photographing the animal and then you can put it in the binder and then um, somebody who's looking for an animal can come through and look at the photo of the animal. What you don't want to have are give them all of the information for claiming it. So it may not have the gender of the animal, it may not have, the lo it's not going to have the location where it was found, you know, those kind of things so that when somebody comes in, they're looking for a stray animal, you're getting all of the information on that animal and then they're going through the binder um, and then you can take them through your barns. They should be escorted through the barns to make sure that um, as they look for the stray animals. Databases. If you were part of the session last week, I talked about having some form of database. So whether that be using your shelter software or whether it's using something just as simple as an access database where you're able to enter all the information in and track that. If you have multiple 
um, shelters for these animals or if you have um, spontaneous disaster shelters for these animals, trying to link all of those animals together and where they're actually housed within the facility and within what facility it will help owners a lot in tracking them. It also helps you a lot in keeping track kind of what, what you have at your facility or what you're responsible for, um, particularly as the operation starts to wind down for those animals who have yet to be claimed. Mapping. Mapping the facility is going to be really important so you know which animals are where. If an animal gets moved from one building or one stall to a different building or stall that needs to be part of the mapping process. This can be done through the database so you can print out those lists but in some form that you know where the animals are so that owners can find them when they come looking for them and certainly so if you have medical care veterinarians doing rounds or if they're um, medicating in some capacity that they're able to find those animals as needed. So um, with the placement of the animals in the facility as part of this process what you have need to have is what building it's in, what row it's in, what stall it is in, and then each stall is going to have that ID number. Putting the information on each stall for what animals are in there so that you have the identification number or do you actually have um, a stall card that's going to have a photograph of the animal, it's going to have the identification number on there. What you don't want to have is any proprietary information on that stall card, um, but having some access to that so people can find I don't know that you're going to be taking animals out of the stalls. Certainly being able to get them out and um, hand walk hand walk some of these animals if you can um, it can be an option. It adds to the risk certainly of losing an animal or for some interaction to happen when you're walking them. So a lot of times those animals aren't being taken out unless it's an owner wanting to do that and you may have owners where these are athletes that have been in training and they're not wanting, wanting them just standing in a stall for however long that disaster may be. For your intake staff, um, with your intake staff it's critical that they have good customer service skills. This is the face of your shelter. They need to be able to handle the high stress of the people that are coming into the facility um, and they, they need to be able to give them that comfort. They need to be able to assure them um, that, you know, how the operation is, the process of it, they're going to get their animals back, all of those per, um, things that an owner is just going to be nervous about, making sure it's getting the proper care that it needs. Um, so as they're going through talking to these owners, getting them set up, it's also critical that they're paying attention to the paperwork. They're getting accurate information, contact information. Um, all of that has to be attention to detail so it's critical that these people good customer service um, they're very thorough in the paperwork and um, and and very attentive to everything that they're writing on this paper on the paperwork too having um, having some kind of a place where the intake processor can initial off or have put their name or something like that so if there is question about the paperwork you can actually go back to the person who processed that animal into the facility. Um, one of the things because this facility with any of the facilities um, some companion animal or your large animal identifying your staff and volunteers is important but certainly with the large animal shelter if you have a lot more owners that are going to be involved in the animals having some kind of an identifier on who's working there so that they might have their their work shirts or a rescue response shirt on. Um, name tags are always great. Duct tape works great as a name tag. You just write your name on, stick it on the sleeve or stick it on the front. Um, but then that they're identified in some capacity. The other thing with name tags, if you're using duct tape, 
you can use different colored tape that signifies what a person can do. So, you know, red duct tape means that they can be back in the stallion or the difficult animal area. Um, you know, that kind of labeling, which also helps you keep track and control the environment. Any questions? All right. So for your owned animals, um, the intake processor is going to fill out the paperwork. I prefer that they do it rather than the owners. The owners are stressed. Um, they're not familiar with the paperwork. There may be some kind of language barrier that makes it difficult for them to, to fill out the paperwork. Um, and there's also a literacy barrier. There, there's still a, a high rate of illiteracy in our country. And so by filling out that paperwork for the owners, you're able to get through the paperwork fairly efficiently and the handwriting, the details, those tend to be more easily read, more accurate. So a good reason for you to fill it out. The other thing with filling out the paperwork is it starts to form a relationship with the owners. So you're asking them the questions about their animals, you're getting the information on them, um, and that interaction I've found can be really helpful in, in continuing to work with the owners throughout because if they have that good experience with the intake processor if something comes up a lot of times they're going back to that person to ask them questions or if they need help it may not be the area that can actually help them with their problem um, but it's certainly somebody who can help direct them because they've already started to establish that relationship um, so with your um, intake your so you're going to have your paperwork they're going to fill out the paperwork the intake processor is going to assign the identification number and make that sure that's on every piece of information every form um, on the id bands and then they're going to band the animals um, or whatever your identifier is going to be you may not be banding some animals because there's not a way to ban those but you need to be able to have some kind of an identifier on the animals um, if there's any problem with the animal getting out and one of the concerns too is there was a, a group that did the disaster sheltering they had a bunch of different animals that were coming in um, that were being brought in by good Samaritans that were being brought in by rescue teams and so all of the sheep were being put in one pen or, and how do you tell the difference then? Chickens, how do you tell the difference? So if you have some way of separating these animals as they're coming in and not putting them all together, which will help, you know, help people find their animals when they come back looking for them, when hopefully they come back looking for them. So as the paperwork is being filled out, you're going to explain everything to the owners. If they're going to be involved in the care, make sure you go through what the expectations for care is, what the rules and regulations of what they can and can't do with their animals. Um, a lot of these people are going to be very familiar with caring for their animals in, in a stable, in a farm environment but reminding them that this is a disaster facility and so there's going to be some different ways that things are going to be done for the best interest of the animals. So you're going to go through all of that, have them sign off on the paperwork. If it's set up as a co-location where the plan is that the owners are going to be involved in the care, then also defining what are the requirements of that. Do they need to be there and care for their animals twice a day? Are they cleaning out the stalls? Um, all of that needs to be laid out with the owners and make sure that they're actually able to do all of that stuff. For the temporary evacuation, you may be in a location or you may have a facility where the owners aren't involved in the care, um, but we certainly want them to continue to visit their animals and to be a part of, of that. Um, it helps with not having animals abandoned, although, well, and, and the reality is, I mean, if their property is burned, the reality is they may not be able to take their animals back. So those are considerations as well in that trying to maintain those relationships with their animals, but also recognizing that 
it can be a really challenge recovery for folks if they've lost everything in their property and they're just not going to be able to return to that property with their animals anytime soon. So all the paperwork, the owners should get copies of that paperwork and also having a copy of the rules and regulations so you can give them a copy of that as well and then also have them sign off understanding you know what those expectations are for it. Um, some of these folks will come with their own feed and routines and supplies and so figuring out how to accommodate all of that, where to keep their food or how they're going to be feeding their animals uh, to make sure that food, you know, that somebody's not taking somebody else's hay, that they can keep them on that stable and um, food source. There should be um, signage up in the facility showing where they can exercise their animals or where they need to dump the manure, um, where the hay is stored, where the feed is stored if you're supplying um, an extra feed sources. All of that stuff needs to be lab um, labeled throughout but also then posting what the rules and regulations are, what the hours of operation are, and um, the other thing is where you're going to be posting when the shelter is going to be wrapping up and coming to a close that you have signage that gives that pertinent information to owners as they're coming in and out of the facility so they can keep updated on, um, on the operation. So um, as the animals are processed in, so you've gone through all of the paperwork, they've signed off on everything, they have a copy of everything, um, and then a handler should escort the owner and their animal to the stall or to the housing area where that animal is going to be held. Um, all the setup for the stall, it, it, it's harder with this as far as setting up. I mean, you, you can certainly set up some of the stalls ahead of time that you put in um, shavings or whatever you're going to use for the bedding of the animals. All of that stuff um, you can set, or a lot of that you can set up ahead of time. Um, ha but having water buckets available, having those things that once the animal comes in, then you're getting the fresh water to them. So whether they're carrying buckets or you have a hose that they can drag to the to the buckets. Um, what kind of feed is going to be supplied? Um, are the owners supplying their own feed? And then what's the time schedule? Being able to get the animals on as consistent a routine as possible. I mentioned that they're highly food aggressive. Getting all of these animals used to that it, the routine throughout that they get fed in the morning, they get fed in the afternoon, and what time periods that's happening um, is going to really help with the chaos of the environment so that you don't have one horse that's being fed by its owner, you know, one time of the day and then you have somebody else coming in another time of the day that it stretches out for hours and hours. Um, unfortunately, you may have some of that if the owners are providing care, but if you can get some sort of routine, it will definitely help. Um, for the the owners that are going to be providing their own care. If they've brought some of their own supplies, um, are they housing it right outside of the stall? There is risk of that, that you're going to have somebody else taking it. So it would be best if they kept their supplies at their trailers and then brought it over for each feeding. Um, it, if there's a lot of them that they're, you know, taking care of a bunch of animals that do you have an extra stall that you can use the one stall and you put all of their supplies in that stall and then secure it for that group of animals. What you want to do is um, if they are supplying the feed, show them where that food is at. Um, and some of these owners may not be used to caring for their horses regularly. Uh, so making sure that they understand what, how much to feed, um, what to feed, when to feed, those kind of things. And then the other thing is, are you using daily care sheets so you're documenting the animals? I highly recommend that you do some sort of daily care sheet for these animals so that you can track not only 
what and how much they're eating, but also track the health and well-being. So, you know, if the manure is runny, if the horse isn't eating, um, if it's been a change of food source to also being aware of the behavioral stuff. If you have, you know, a horse, for example, that's laying down, getting back up, poking its stomach, laying down, rolling, you know, those kind of things that people are aware that we could have some problem going on with col colic. Um, if the horse hasn't been pooping or it poops, you know, a couple little pieces and then tries to poop a couple little more pieces again, um, that all that stuff is being tracked so we can get veterinary care to those animals pretty immediately. Uh, if they're cleaning their own stalls, show them where all of the wheelbarrows are and where do they dump the manure buckets or dump the manure um, if the wheelbarrow and also the water buckets, making sure that if they're dumping, you know, cleaning out where they clean out the water buckets, where they dump the water buckets, uh, and then the cleaning and we'll talk about the cleaning decon area, um, but what the procedures are for cleaning and decontaminating the water buckets, the food bins, and um, and then ultimately if you have to decontaminate the stalls uh, before another animal comes in or if you have an animal that breaks with something that's contagious. The animal handler escorts them um, to the check-in out and then re-explains that process for checking in when they come to, to visit or care for their animals. So um, for owners that aren't providing the care, it's still a good idea to escort them back to where the stall is going to be, um, showing them where their animal will be at, and then escorting them back to the check-in out area and explaining what the procedure is going to be for them to come in and to visit their animals. Encouraging them to visit is going to be really good and certainly in Encouraging them to provide care whenever possible is also good. So, strays from the public. You have an amazing number of animals that will be brought in that somebody just picks these up. Um, the one disaster, there was somebody who actually was able to fit a pony into a convertible, um, which doesn't seem like a good idea, but it was that or the fire, so they put the pony in the convertible, it was walking around the street, so they put it in their convertible and they drove it to the disaster shelter. Um, so you have animals that are coming into the facility that, you know, people just want to help. With these animals, um, we're going to process that animal in and what you want to do is collect where was the animal found, do they know who potentially, because some of these people, they're, they know the people in their neighborhood, so they may know whose animal possibly it is, so if you can get any of that kind of information, uh, and then identifiers on the animals, um, you may find one, they have some, they might have something on their halters, um, sometimes people will take and um, use grease pens or will use even spray paint where they'll spray paint uh, a phone number on those particular animals and then they just you know cut the fences and let the animals go so you want to check all of that information to see if there's any kind of identifier on it um, their microchipping uh, for large animals isn't huge um, in some areas it tends to be a little more popular uh, but we're not seeing the amount of microchipping in the large animals that we see in the small animals uh, but there, there is some of that and certainly know your area on whether or not the there you know there are is a push to microchip the large animals if they are being uh, microchipped um, the crest of the neck mid neck area tends to be where those animals are being microchipped uh, so running the scanner all around that neck area to see if there could be a chip um, there's a question about how do you get the disaster shelter location information out to the public um, certainly if you have a um, animal response team that's part of the process or that's part of the mission a lot of times for the disaster animal response teams that they're public education the other piece of it is with this we want to be part of the disaster 
plan. So you want it to have worked with emergency management. You want to be in the system working with all of the jurisdictional authorities um, so that that when information goes out to the disaster, it's just like the human shelter where they say go to this school or this location for um, for the sheltering. We want to have the animal shelters, small and large, part of that so it goes out across that network on, you know, on the TVs, on the um, internet, if there's a website to go to, those kind of things. You want to make sure that um, that information is out ahead of time as much as possible. A lot of times there's also a, a toll-free number that is put up. And the other place that you find that that information is, is when there is a disaster, an emergency um, a management is activated, when the response is activated um, at the um, EOC, or your emergency operations center, that people can call and get information on where to take their animals there. And it's important in part of the education process that you let the boarding facilities know, you let rescues know, you let all of these people aware of where who's in charge when it comes to disaster and then where the shelters are going to be set up. Um, the question is, if even if chipping is not widely practiced, is it still best practice to scan? I, I mean, it... It certainly never hurts to scan every animal that comes in and as much as possible to scan um, the animals. It It's hard to find the chips on the cats and dogs, you know, on our small animals, so it's even harder, I think, on the large animals. But my feeling is, is we want to try and get the animals back to their owners. So it really doesn't hurt that if you have the scanners and you have the ability to do it, taking every step possible to to find information on those animals, I, I see no harm in it. Um, strays from the rescue teams. With this, uh, again, you'll have, I mentioned the EOC, or your Emergency Operations Center. There is going to be a number set up, or generally there's a number set up where people can call in with needs to the disaster. So they'll call in and report their information. So that owner requested where they can't get back to their property to get their animal or they're being evacuated and they don't have trailers to get their animals off or to get all of their animals off, which often is a reality where you have people who just don't, they don't have a trailer or they don't have a trailer for as many animals as they have. So these folks calling in and wanting help getting their animals off. Um, another piece of this is if they don't have enough trailer space for all of their animals, once they leave an area that is being evacuated, a lot of times they're not going to be allowed to go back in to get the rest of their animals. And so it's going to be the rescue teams that are able sometimes able to get into those areas to get the animals out. So those are going to be your owner requested and um, rescues. Additionally, you're going to have um, animals at large. And so the rescue teams are going to be collecting all of these animals. If they have an owner requested rescue, there should be paperwork that's already filled out with a lot of the basics on what those animals are that they're going to pick up. For animals at large, they should have paperwork that they're filling out all of the information on the animal where they found it. Uh, and certainly, if there are other animals in the area that they've not been able to pick up, documenting that as well. Um, or at a, a farm, they go to a location, but they just can't get them. Um, fire's coming, you're documenting the information, you're getting what you can, and unfortunately you're having to evacuate um, as quickly as possible with the animals that you can get. So, we're going to document all of that on the paperwork, and then um, anything in part of it is the rescue teams are doing some basic triage, so they're going to look and see if there's any concerns with those animals and make sure they're even, what the procedures are. If it's a serious health concern that needs immediate medical attention, that they're getting it to, if there's a vet triage set up someplace, if it's going back to the shelter, or if there's an emergency vet clinic that they're able to take those animals to. 
that has to be part of the process and then that also needs to be documented on all paperwork and then that paperwork even if they take the animal to um, a, another clinic who's taking those animals in that the paperwork is tracking so that the jurisdictional authority for these animals knows where each and every animal that is that was part of the disaster system so once you pick it up it's your responsibility to continue to track it from wherever it goes so when these teams get back to the shelter, they're bringing all of the paperwork with them on those animals. And so as they're offloading those animals, they're able to, to give the paperwork to the intake processors. And then from there, the intake processors at the shelter are going to finish the processing the animal into the facility. They're going to ban um, ID the animal and then all of the paperwork is going to go into the stray binder so that people can go through that binder then and try and find it. Um, let me go back here with the stray binder um, or folder also make sure that there's follow-up because you're going to have people who are calling to look for an animal. You may not have that animal in, but you need to be tracking all of that information on what somebody's looking for and then going through that as strays come into the shelter so you can check back on that if somebody's looking for something that you know you might have that animal just came in that you can talk to um, talk to those owners and let them know that you might have their animal so they can come check it out. Excuse me. So when the um, stray comes into the facility, the handler is going to come and get that animal, take it to its stall, set it up with all of the care that it needs. If it's getting, I mean, all of them are going to have fresh water. Are you haying them when they come in? Um, that should be part of your standard operating procedures, what you do, or if you're going to wait and you're going to hay them when they, you know, at the regular feeding times. With um, the other thing the handlers need to do, if intake doesn't know, like hasn't assigned the stall, so they know which stall is empty and say, okay, take this animal to this row, this building, this stall, then the animal handler needs to then take that information back to intake and say, okay, this is the building row stall that that animal was just placed in. And that's part of your tracking mapping. So, um, some some of the procedures is, as you're planning through your shelter operation is looking at what the procedures are going to be for the veterinarians and with this is do you have the resources to actually do what's in your plan so are they going to each and every animal when it comes to the facility is it being examined by a veterinarian are you checking vaccinations and if the animal has um, doesn't have proof of the vaccinations are you then vaccinating those animals that if that's your procedure just with this like with the small animals if your procedure is going to be that you are going to have um, animals that are going to be that you're going to do certain vaccinations if you don't have that on um, on record if you don't have all of their proof of, of those things then you have to have the vaccines and you have to have the veterinarians who can do that part of the intake process for these animals is one of the things is collect who is the owner's veterinarian um, and you want to be able to follow up if if the animal is injured if it gets sick um, that you know is the disaster shelter veterinarian providing care or is that person's veterinarian going to provide care which adds another challenging dimension because the vets are going to be incredibly busy during a disaster and so being able to get them to the facility could be challenging so you want to make sure that they're giving authorization that if their regular veterinarian can't be contacted um, that the shelter the disaster shelter veterinarian is able to intervene and provide the care that's needed so your supplies um, for your animal care your supplies um, certainly that they have 
halters available if animals are coming in and don't have that. Um, lead ropes, not all animals are going to have any kind of, um, like, the sheep may not have something on them or the goats may not have something on them or whatever that is might have not they're just in the pens you're moving them around the pens if you're going to be moving animals out of the pens then you need to have some sort of restraint in order to do that um, we want uh, manure forks and whether you're doing manure buckets or you're doing a wheelbarrow and I'll talk some of the precautions as far as um, which you're using and certainly the, the potential spread of contaminants. Um, for the buckets, we want to have scrub brushes available so you can scrub out the buckets. Um, particularly, you have a, a lot of horses that, well, I won't speak just for the horses, but you'll have animals that like to dip their hay um, or will... Um, plop their manure in the water buckets so we want to make sure that those buckets are being kept kept clean um, and particularly horses they don't they won't drink out of dirty buckets so if there's they've been dunking their hay and it's full the water buckets full of hay they won't now drink that water um, if it's got manure in it they certainly won't drink that water and the other thing with the buckets is if it's a winter disaster you want to make sure that you're dumping out the ice, that it's not just breaking the ice up and leaving the ice in that. Um, a lot of animals, and again, I'll talk horses specifically, horses will not drink out of a bucket that has ice floating in it a lot of times. So you need to keep those buckets changed out um, with at least, it's going to be hard to put warm water in them certainly, but at least not freezing water and certainly not water buckets that have ice floating in it because they won't do a good job of staying hydrated. Um, so your all of your other farm stuff, your brooms, your shovels, uh, if you have wheeled carts that you can move the hay and the shavings around with, um, depending on what kind of bedding you're doing with those animals. Checking with the owners, if you're not, some animals will eat shavings, some will eat straw, so also watching that, particularly if um, if they're compromised at all. If they're not been well fed or have been out for a while, they may be eating their bedding, so you want to watch that with the different animals. And as I mentioned, the gloves, making sure that you have gloves to go between animals. Um, animal care staff, they're going to be cleaning stalls, they're going to be feeding, they're going to be watering. Um, a lot of the stuff like restocking the hay so that you have hay in one building but you're bringing it to the different buildings and putting it outside of a stall or every so many spaces down the, the um, rows so that people have access to that. So they're going to have a lot of different responsibilities and it's a lot of times it's just hard labor responsibilities of moving the feet around, moving the hay around, making sure there are shavings. Um, owners may be involved in some of that stuff but plan on your volunteers doing a lot of work with that as well. And then the handling of them. If you have folks who are going into the stalls and are working with the animals, I recommend that you have multiple people that you can watch, at least as you become familiar with them. I mean, I go into my stalls all the time and I clean the stalls by myself with a horse in there. I'm familiar with those animals. Unfamiliar animals in a disaster environment, you need to take extra precautions. So, what that may be that you have multiple people providing care. So, you have one person who has the head of the animal, the other person is doing the cleaning, and then they're able to move the animal around the stall to protect the person who's cleaning from, from either bite or kick from the animal that's in the stall. And then, if you are exercising them, Certainly being able to get them out and walking them is is a good idea whenever possible to do that. Again, primarily here I'm talking about what you have with your um, with your horses. For the other animals, check with the owners as far as what their their needs are for their you know alpacas, llamas, those kind of things. You're not going to be able to get the sheep and goats out necessarily to walk them, but particularly with your horses, making sure that they're getting a certain level of exercise which is healthier for them than just standing in the stalls um, 
over the length that you might have going on. With the exercising, it's going to be really difficult to have turnout for them, and we don't want to be mixing them where you're turning a bunch of unknown animals out into a pasture together. It's going to create too many problems with the animals and potential uh, injury or escape. Your animal care team, they need to be working in the same barn. They need to be working um, with the same animals so that they're familiar with those animals. It will help the animals get more socialized, more comfortable in that environment, but it also helps for the caretakers as they're more familiar with the animal they will notice more quickly if there's some kind of problem animal care team they're in there doing the feeding doing the cleaning but they're also the ones who should be looking at the animals are there any little nicks are there any cuts are the animals favoring a limb do they seem to be struggling or uncomfortable or is there something just off the caretakers are the ones who often are going to be the first ones to notice this. Again, if there's owners involved, hopefully they're going to be the ones to notice it. But also keep in mind they're highly stressed with everything that's going on. And so having the care teams that are responsible in certain areas that can keep an eye on it to, you know, just help catch those things as soon as they come up. So um, with the care of the animals, we want to be consistent in how care is being provided. And so you're moving down the row, taking care of every animal in that row, and then coming up the other side, making sure that you go through every stall as you get to it. If there's an animal that a caretaker is not comfortable going in that stall, then you need to have that stall caught by the person skipping that stall and going on to the next one. It's going to get missed. So making sure that you're, you're flagging, that you're not comfortable with that, that when it's that stall's turn, that you get the person who can handle that animal, who can pull it out so the caretaker can clean it or whatever that looks like. Um, and trying to keep that consistent routine for them. Um, they like routine, they're comfortable with routine, and will do much better with that um, overall routine if you can get it established. And the sooner you get it established, the better for everybody. Um, if the owners are providing their own care, then this, the animal care staff can assist with that. They can help with the cleaning. They can help with the handling if the owner needs just some support because the animal keeps wanting to run out of the stall when they go into it. Um, and then certainly the staff is there to help with where the supplies are. So if an owner runs out of something, then the caretakers can provide that additional assistance. The other thing that they're doing is when an owner isn't around, they're continuing to check on those animals and then they can provide you know water if it's in between the owner visits we want to keep them in water all the time when owners aren't able to provide the care then that's where the shelter staff needs to be aware of it so they can step in and provide the care so for shelter staff they should be changing gloves between animals um, or between enclosures if there's multiple animals in a in enclosure wearing nitrile gloves is not something that most large animal people do in this environment taking those extra precautions is is just a good idea to do it um, they want to make sure that when they are cleaning if you're cleaning with a wheelbarrow and you go from one stall to the next stall um, the animals are going to want to be sniffing out of it they may be nibbling hay out of it and so you need to keep them away from the manure of the other animals this is where the manure buckets work really well in that you have a big bin, you put the manure in the bin, and that bin belongs to that large animal. If, or the other option is that you clean out the manure, you just clean it out into the alleyway, and then it gets picked up from the alleyway so that the, the horses or other animals aren't able to come into contact with the other animal's manure. The caretaker's shelter staff veterinarians hopefully are doing rounds that you have enough vet that they can just go through and do rounds where they're checking on these animals um, but staff needs to be paying really close attention to them to see if there's any 
concerns with the animals as far as any nasal discharge, um, anything where they seem like they're just off. Um, that kind of information needs to go right to the veterinarian so that they can be checked. The precautions need to be taken with the those animals so that we make sure um, that if you have an animal that has any kind of discharge, is coughing, is showing any signs of anything, um, that they go to ISO and if there's any of that discharge that gets on the caretaker, um, that, that that precautions are being made that the caretaker needs to change or they need to wear Tyvek around them, those kind of things. Um, watching loss of appetite with these animals is another indicator that there could be something going on with them. So, um, with with the the diseases, they are there's a lot of particularly horse diseases that are highly contagious. Um, they can spread very rapidly through a horse prop, um, population, and it's because it's um, aerosolized. It's in their cough. So if they cough on the person and, you know, animals are nosy, so they like to rub on the people who are in there. You go from horse to horse or from animal to animal and you've got that discharge on it, then you're going to be spreading it. Um, the passive transfer is not only on that clothing then, but it's also on any of the equipment, which is also why having um, a poop bucket or manure bucket designated for an animal um, is important that we're not letting the animals come into contact with each other's stuff um, and that there's extra attention paid to where you're regularly washing your hands and using um, hand sanitizer between animals and the gloves. So um, with some of the horse diseases to look for what you have is with um, with the equine influenza, this is nearly 100% infectious for unvaccinated horses. So because we have an unknown population, we want to take the extra precautions that potentially they are going to be unvaccinated. There's um, a relatively short incubation time with this and so it can be from one to five days of incubation so you can see how quickly that can spread through your population um, with it what we see with these guys is it's like a flu they're running a fever um, they have a dry hacking cough they'll have runny noses you'll see where they they seem kind of depressed they're feeling off they just look off um, they may not be eating or drinking properly and so you really want to watch that too because then with that if they're not hydrating um, then they're becoming dehydrated and we need to look at either IV sub Q um, probably with these guys you're just doing an IV with these guys um, and then there's a long recovery time for these guys so you're looking at um, two to three weeks recovery time for the feline um, influenza. The other concern um, with them is that you have your equine herpes virus. Um, there are actually five different types of equine or of the herpes virus. Um, it, with the transmission, what you have is an infected animal. Um, they're coming into contact with other animals. It's a nose-to-nose -nose contact, um, but it also can be in. Um, indirect contact where it's um, it's through the clothing that we're wearing it's in the manure bin if you have a horse that sneezes um, the lovely fluid there coming out of the nose into the manure bucket that they're getting um, it that way with it the other increase with this is stress so for these animals that are in a highly stressed environment because of the disaster sheltering um, what you have is much more susceptibility to it. Um, vaccinations with it reduce the severity of it and the duration, but it will not totally prevent it. The next one here, um, strangles. Strangles is another large concern. Um, with these, it um, is again, it's highly contagious. It's um, upper respiratory infection. Um, 
with a streptococcus um, bacteria. With this infection, um, what you have are the general present is what you're seeing here in the photographs, where it's coming out as a nasal discharge, they'll have a fever, um, they'll have swollen and enlarged lymph nodes, and then as you can see um, with this lower picture here, um, you'll see in this photo where you can see all of the pus coming out of here. We see it a lot of times too in the chest area. Anywhere there are lymph nodes, you'll see that infection coming out. Um, with this, the animals, you know, are going to show all of the other signs where they're not eating. They're probably not hydrating well. Um, and you'll see that a lot of times it will start to present with that before you even see the infection coming out through the nose and through the lymph nodes. Um, but we want to watch that. You also um, want to watch that, you know, with the not eating, not drinking, that they're staying hydrated. Um, again, they may need to be, need um, IV fluids as well as the treatment for this is highly contagious. This gets on the stalls um, and it can spread simply from being in contact with a stall that's been contaminated. So if you have an animal that breaks with strangle, certainly you need to move it to an isolation area, um, taking precautions that it's not, it's not um, exposing the rest of the population, but then that stall also should just be shut down. It needs to go through a whole cleaning sterilization process. Um, with these guys, um, there are vaccines. It's both intramuscular and intranasal vaccines. Um, in general, we you can isolate new horses from the population. In the disaster shelter, we're not able to do that. Um, so we're simply isolating them once they present with this kind of thing. Anybody who's working with any of these guys, you, you saw in the last slide here, um, the Tyvek suit. This gentleman is wearing a Tyvek suit to prevent it getting on their clothing. Anybody who's working with any of these animals should be taking those extra precautions of wearing some form of Tyvek um, to prevent it. With them, then after you're done working with them, you also want to make sure that you're washing your hands um, and um, using hand sanitizer in between and changing clothes. Any tools that are used for cleaning out the stalls, providing care for those animals need to be kept separated and maintained just for those particular animals. With um, the equipment, with your um, cleaning and sanitation area, there should be a location away from the main population of your shelter, so far enough away that you can do all of the cleaning and decontamination. Certainly, if there's a cement pad or some place that you can do it where the, the you're not doing it on soil, washing away the, the manure and cleaning buckets and all of that stuff. If it can be in a washing station, that would be better. Um, washing the stuff, Dawn dish detergent works well for cleaning it, Clorox bleach for bleaching out buckets, um, and then um, that you have large wash containers. If you're not washing individual buckets, you can have stock tanks that are part of your cleaning process. So you, and I'll, I'll go through that a little bit here with the procedures um, for doing that kind of thing, how we're setting up the stock tanks to do the cleaning. I'll cover that here in a minute. Um, having scrub brushes available and then hoses um, with spray nozzles. So this is someplace out of the way. The wastewater is either being gone into the sewer system into a drain or there's some some place that you can run it so people aren't and animals aren't tracking through it and certainly can't drink out of it. Um, the animal care staff may be the ones tending this, but depending on the size of your operation, how big the disaster is, you may actually have folks who that's their specific job is just keeping buckets and feed bins and all of that clean. Any equipment that goes between animals needs to be cleaned and sanitized, so 
bucket goes from one stall to the next stall, it has to go through a whole cleaning and actual decon before it, or sanitation before it goes to the next stall. Having three bins available, you're washing, hosing off the debris and contaminants from any of the bins or buckets. Then you have a dish soap and hot water in one bin, so you hose off the organic matter, put it into the cleaning bin, wash it, goes into a second bin of fresh water, or you can just, again, hose off the suds and that, and then there needs to be a bleach. If you're putting them in the bleach solution, it should be mixed as a 1 to 32 ratio, and the everything needs to stay in contact with that bleach solution for a minimum of 10 minutes for it to have been effective as far as sanitizing um, the item. So, if you um, have any wire crates and you may have some of those for some of your animals if you're housing um, fowl or if you have are also housing people's um, companion animals at this facility then the precautions are going to be the same thing that we talked about um, with the uh, in the small animal companion section if you have wire crates those crates need to be scrubbed before another animal comes into it so you're scrubbing all of the wires scrubbing the cage floors so it's you know hose off the organic ma organic matter scrub them with the dish detergent hose them off again and then you can actually just do a spray of um, the 1 to 32. So, and then we can let things air dry. If it's um, water buckets and stuff like that, once it's been hosed off and cleaned, certainly that stuff can go back to, to use. If it's a cage that an animal is being housed in, it needs to be dried completely before you put the companion animal back into that cage. So the routines. With the routines for these guys, um, the morning routine leadership needs to do a walkthrough. Eyeball every animal in every stall, every pen, every cage in the facility. You're going to check everyone to make sure that they seem to be doing okay. You haven't had any births. You haven't had any animals um, die overnight. Hopefully Injuries happen, disaster happens, so we certainly want to be keeping an eye on them, but it is a reality that you could have problems in the shelter with animals because of their injuries. So we're going to watch for those kind of things. If there's any health concerns, if there's any births, a veterinarian needs to be noted, uh, notified immediately so they can respond to that. So you've done your morning walkthrough, and a lot of times um, with the walkthrough is having people who are familiar with those animals in that area so you have a team that's used to working in each one of the barns or each one of the rows let them do the walkthrough as well they're familiar with the animals so they may notice something sooner um, so they do the walkthrough and then they come back to the morning briefing your briefing covering the updates covering the changes any new people who are going to be there helping out, make sure you're introducing those people, um, veterinarians, any information they have as far as things to watch for, or if there's been any outbreaks, or if there's concerns. That information is all passed on in the briefing. And then every briefing, you need to go over policies and procedures, reminding people not to be taking photographs, not to be posting on social media, um, there should be a public information officer as part of the response and they'll say what information is out there so if there's um, your if people are allowed to post information that was already posted on the official website or it's the Humane Society that's jurisdictional authority they're posting information on their Facebook page or their website are your staff volunteers allowed to repost that on their own to spread the word or is there zero posting of any photos or any information remind people of that every single briefing and debriefing for that matter so after you've gone through and done the the walkthrough there's been the briefing and then people go and start the feeding 
um, routine going through making sure everybody has food whatever grain they may be getting if they're getting any everybody's gotten their hay and the watering with the watering I can't stress that people aren't just sticking the hose through the rails and filling up a water bucket that they're actually looking in the water bucket prior to again you have horses that will dunk their hay you have horses who regularly poop in their bucket um, same thing other animals who will defecate in their bucket so we want to make sure that those are being cleaned out before fresh water is being given and then after they've had time um, you've gone through and done that then you can go through and start the cleaning procedures it actually helps too if some if the animal is or grazing on their hay that you can then go through and start the cleaning while they're eating and a lot of times it's then easier to you know do the cleaning because they're engaged in activities and aren't poking and bothering you while you're trying to clean um, after all of the stalls are cleaned the aisleways need to be raked if um, or swept up of any loose manure, any hay droppings, just keeping it extra clean, preventing slips, pre preventing animals coming into contact with stuff other than their own. Um, and so you go through that whole routine. That's going to take probably all morning, um, potentially into the afternoon, depending on how many animals you have. Um, and then it starts the next routine after you're done with that in the afternoon then you'd go through um, and get ready for the next feeding so it's if you can get everybody through the whole cleaning process feeding process in the morning and then your volunteers take a break they have lunch they get their rest time um, and then they go back to the afternoon chores restocking the hay um, bedding, putting shavings outside of the doors or whatever you're using for your beddings. Then they're going through and they're cleaning all the buckets and bins, getting ready for the next um, routine. And then the afternoon routine where the animals are being fed, watered, um, spot cleaning the stalls, and then again going through sweeping and cleaning the aisleways after all of that's done hopefully there's time then that you can go restock for the meeting for the morning so you're bringing in all the hay and bedding and getting it ready cleaning up all the buckets bins so that you have your food sources you have all of that ready for the for the evening um, or for the next morning routine and then finally in the evening the last thing you're doing is you're going through and you're topping off all of the water buckets making sure everybody has clean water and then um, securing the stalls and making sure and there are some animals that are escape artists so they can actually open the doors um, so if they can actually get their heads out of the stalls to unlatch the doors um, making sure if you need to secure those um, with clips or some other form of making sure that they can't open up those stalls. So for leadership, um, head counts are important. So if you can be doing head counts at least twice a day, so you do a head count in the morning, you do a head count in the evening before the operation is done. If you can do a third head count in the middle of the day, it's a really good idea to try and do that third one. Um, and then securing the facility, turning lights down or off so that the animals have that rest time. Most likely you're going to have this type of facility staffed 24 hours a day. With that, it's not 24 hours of care. It's 24 hours of staffing so that you can secure it. What we want to do is give these animals time to rest and sleep at night. Um, and if you have the lights on and people are constantly doing things, the animals aren't going to get the rest they need. Um, and that is greatly going to impact their overall health if it's a long period of time that they're not getting proper rest and sleep added to the stress that they're having and potential injuries. So the last thing that happens then is there is a debrief at the end of the day. The debrief wrapping up what happened during the day, um, any changes that are going to happen for the next day, updates, um, updating what's happening with the overall operation. So 
if when so the shelter closing down, updating changes in the routines, um, those kind of things, S stuff like you're getting a shipment of, you know, a semi of truck of hay coming in, and so there's going to be a need to offload all of that, or you know, whatever information might be, all of that gets covered. Also in the debrief, we want to be able to have it that um, there's. Um, there's coverage on, um, there's a chance to just talk to everybody, I guess, in that you're checking in with everybody, how they're doing, what their needs are, are they holding up in, in the work, are they doing okay with the animals, are they doing okay with the disaster, it's a really difficult, stressful stressful time for everybody. The work is hard in the barns. You may have volunteers that are not accustomed to to working the kind of work that's involved in the disaster shelter. And so with this it's also a time just to kind of get a check-in with people and how they're doing. It's not therapy so don't try to to get them to that place or don't encourage people to talk about you know the the stresses or anything else. We're not trained to lead that kind of therapy. It's just a check-in. If you see somebody's really struggling, that they're having problems with what's going on, then we want to, you know, we want to be able to follow up with that kind of thing and get them the help that they need or get them the time off. One of the things that, um, one of the things that you're going to run into with the operations that you're going to be running it's going to probably be your community or a neighboring community you have people who may be affected by the disaster in some capacity but are still trying to help with the disaster and so they're going to have that added stresses people are coming in and they're doing shifts and then going home to deal with their day-to-day -day lives and it it that adds to it it's also harder to keep track of people because of the way things are coming and going so doing these kind of debriefs and these kind of check-ins and then also following up with people um, that you have some kind of a volunteer coordinator who can check on folks um, at the end of the shift and at the end of their disaster to make sure you know that they're doing okay with everything so um, that all takes place in the wrap up of the day and certainly having hours for these operations so even though you have folks who may be staying on site you need to make sure that there are clearly defined hours that they're allowed to be there visiting their animals so that you don't have them wandering around all hours of the night and day because they're there and they have nothing else to do so um, are there any questions on any of that? Okay, we have covered a lot in these four sessions in in the disaster preparedness piece of it, in putting together your plan, developing your standard operating procedures, um, getting your routines in place, knowing you know what facilities you might be able to use. It, I can't stress enough how important it is to try and put that plan together and to be able to walk through all of your planning process and make sure that, that you have an idea of the facilities, but then that your teams, anybody who might be involved in the operation, is also familiar with with what the routines are going to be, where the shelters are going to be located, and the setup of it, that it's not... Certainly you're going to have leadership people who are going to be setting up and establishing the the overall operation, but if there's any way that you can be practicing these things ahead of time and going through that process, it's going to make it much smoother when the disaster app actually happens. People are more familiar, and I mean you guys are familiar with what's been happening in Colorado the last few years with floods and flyers and everything else going on um, that you can't be prepared enough for what may be happening so develop your plans and actually practice your plans so um, are there any questions
All right. Um, thanks, Deborah. Um, everybody, there's um, if any if there are any questions, please feel free to type them here, and and we'll we can talk about those questions. Otherwise, you have Deborah Schnockenberg's. Um, contact information with Pet Aid Colorado and my contact information with Disaster Animal Shelter Education. So please feel free to contact either one of us um, with any questions that you may have. And and certainly a big thank you to Deborah um, and Pet Aid Colorado, the work that they're doing to help Colorado and certainly the work that Deborah is doing um, to bring this kind of information and all the other information that she's bringing to, to Colorado. Um, having traveled around the country and talked to a lot of people, the stuff that's happening in Colorado is some really good things. So you guys are certainly fortunate to have those kind of things available to you. So, all right, that's my spiel. So please, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, thank you. Thanks, everybody.